you would turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, I'd like to read for you the first 12 verses. And again, our, uh, the theme or the, the particular truth we're looking at this morning comes from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1, but I'd like to read for you verses 1 through 12. Would you please listen carefully to this? This is not the word of man, this is the word of God. Paul writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Let me just read the next couple of verses. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Again, we're going to be focusing on that particular phrase in verse 11, referring to God who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, just by way of quick review, we have seen that revival does two things towards advancing the work of redemption. It certainly accelerates the bringing in of Christ's sheep. When the Lord pours out of his Holy Spirit, more people are awakened and convicted. They see and they put their trust in Jesus Christ. And by the same means, it speeds up the subjection of Christ's enemies. Remember, the Bible actually tells us that the Father has promised to, uh, to the Son that all of his enemies one day will be subdued under his feet. And that isn't going to happen by military force. It's going to happen from within. Everyone is going to bow the knee because they want to, either because they love the Lord or because they recognize his power and they bow in fear. The Bible says that everyone one day is going to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, revival speeds up that process. Now, we've also seen that the work of redemption is carried on by the Spirit of God. He's the one who strengthens his people to be able to get out there with the gospel. He's the one who takes that gospel and brings the truth of the gospel home to the lost. He's the one that convinces them that it's true. I mean, there's only so much we can do to try to convince their intellect and remove all the obstacles they might have by all the people in the world who don't believe. But the Spirit of God convinces beyond a shadow of a doubt, shows them the truth. In revival, the Spirit works more powerfully so that both of these things are intensified. God's people have much more power and strength, much more confidence and conviction, and can speak from the heart to the heart. Their love is intensified. 
That's what the Spirit of God is. He is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. And the more we have of him, the more we will love others and desire to bring the gospel to them. But again, he's also the one that brings the lost face to face with the truth of the gospel. And then we saw last week that there is something that we can do to promote this work. If the Spirit of God is the one who actually brings these changes about, strengthens us and opens the eyes of others, we can pray that the Lord would send His Spirit and would enliven us and revive us and strengthen His love in us. That He would help us to use those different means He's given to us to gain more of His help, reading His Word, hearing His Word preached, uh, praying, especially prayer, but even, again, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, these are different means that God gives to us more of his Holy Spirit so that we can love more. And in the same way, we can also hold on to the influence that we have of the Spirit of God. You realize you can, you can spend all day using the means of grace or praying and reading and seeking the Lord, and you can gain some influence, but every time you give in to some sin, you grieve and quench the Spirit of God and you lose that precious influence of the Spirit. So we need to work to gain, as it were, His help. And then we need to make sure we don't just throw it away by giving in to our sins. We need to preserve what we have of the Spirit of God. And once we have been revived, then we can pray that the Lord would revive our brethren, that He would revive this fellowship, that He would revive His church as a whole. And then, of course, as we are all revived, we can begin to pray that God would send his spirit on the lost so that when we go out to bring the gospel to them, when we go out to gather them, the spirit of God will have gone before us to prepare their hearts to receive his word. You know, it's been said by those who understand the connection between prayer and the work that God calls us to do, that the real work is the work of prayer. And once we've prayed and we've sought the Lord for the blessing, when we actually go out to do what he calls us to do, that's just the mop-up operation. That's going to be the easy part once we've sought the Lord in prayer. But I tell you what, if you don't seek the Lord in prayer and you try to go out and do the work, well, then the work is the hard part. You can't do it because you don't have the Lord's blessing. We need to seek the Lord in prayer. I've been here for 19 years and it's still dawning on me more and more of just how much we need prayer. And yet that's the thing that we probably spend the least amount of time doing is praying. But that is the work. That's the main work, seeking the Lord for this blessing. So we need to pray more. We need to seek the Lord more. That's actually what we're going to be looking at and focusing on this evening. I think um, that is the key. Now this morning, let's consider one last thing regarding revival, and that is that it is sovereignly in God's hands, as everything else is. Paul reminds us in our passage that he works all things after the counsel of his will. Now it's certainly true that in this context that Paul was applying God's sovereignty to the Ephesian believers, pointing out that it was God's sovereignty that actually brought them to faith in the first place. God chose them before the foundation of the world, which means before God had created the world, God had purposed that they would be his, to be holy, to be his people, to be those that he would fill with his Holy Spirit. He wouldn't save them because they were holy. That's how many Christians today look at the way this process works, but he saved them so that they would be holy, chose them that they would be. He predestined them to adoption, that they would be his children. That his grace, which means his unmerited favor, his love, would be magnified because no one deserves salvation. What we deserve is to be punished for our sins, but God doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what Jesus deserves if we are willing to trust in Jesus. And when we do trust in Jesus and receive that grace, it magnifies God's mercy and grace. And that's the reason why he did this, was because he wanted to show us just how merciful he is and how gracious he is. So Paul wanted the Ephesians to know that their salvation was a sovereign gift of God, and he deserved all the glory for it. 
Well, what was true of them is no less true of you. You were saved by God's sovereign choice if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the same is true with regard to everyone else that God is going to save. Whether that number be many or few at any given time, that is sovereignly in his hands, which means revival is sovereignly in his hands. Now, let's consider how God's sovereignty fits in with the responsibility that we know God has given uh, to be ours in the work of revival. And I want us to see two things this morning. First of all, that God will work all things according to his will, and that includes revival. He will bring it in his time. But second, that his sovereignty in these things does not negate, doesn't cancel out our responsibility to pray for and to seek the lost. They actually go hand in hand, really, because um, what we do and what God commands us to do is all a part of his plan as well. Well, first of all, God is absolutely sovereign over all things, and he works everything according to his will, even revival in his timing. Now, I hope that, there's at least, that at least this much is perfectly clear from Scripture, and that is the fact that God is absolutely sovereign. Some people might look at that as a bad thing, those people who don't like God, but those who love him see it as a very positive thing because we know God is perfect and will do everything perfectly. But as to the fact that God is sovereign, I mean, our text tells us as much. If we had no other passage of Scripture, we would have that truth given to us here he works all things according to the counsel of his will. In the Greek, the idea is God continually works, not just some things, but all things according to his plan. Not just big things, not just small things, but everything. God has a plan, and he is working that plan out. Now, that's one of the reasons why I read the meditation that I did from Isaiah 46. Again, listen to what he says. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Now, how is it that God can say from ancient times the things that haven't been done yet? How can he know the future? Well, it's because he knows what he's going to do in the future. He knows what his plan is, and that's why he can tell us what's going to happen. He goes on to apply this to Judah in particular. He says, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country, Truly I have spoken. Truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. God has a plan. And God is going to bring that plan about. Now, the second thing we need to understand from Scripture is that it's also perfectly clear that God has planned to advance the kingdom of his Son that redemptive kingdom of which evangelism is all a part of, well beyond what it is right now. God actually has said he's going to fill the entire world with his kingdom. He said as much to King Nebuchadnezzar in the dream that he had. Again, I've made reference to this dream several times over the course of this month. But we had the dream of the statue made with the different metals and how each of the metals represented a different kingdom and how in the days of the kings represented by the feet of clay mixed with iron and the ten toes, that there would be a kingdom that would be set up. It was that stone cut without hands. It smashes the, the, uh, the feet and the statue falls over and it shatters. The wind comes and blows it all away. And all that's left is the stone that struck the statue's feet. That stone grows into a great mountain that fills the whole earth. What did that mean? Well, Daniel actually interpreted that, and he said, this is what it means. In the days of those kings, the kings represented by the feet of clay and iron, of the ten toes, in the day, that's the Roman Empire, by the way. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end 
to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Well, that is the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom that he brought in in the days of those kings, which is the Roman Empire, he set up the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. It will crush and put an end to all other kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. By the way, that is why Jesus told his disciples to go out into all the worlds and make disciples of all the nations. Because the kingdom, though it begins small, is going to grow and it's going to fill the whole earth. And the way it's going to be filled is through his church bringing the gospel to others. So he calls them, he commands them to go out into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, that he would be with them to help them carry this out. This is the will of our Lord Jesus Christ, our King, to move the kingdom of heaven forward until it fills the whole earth. You see, we know what his will is, and that's why we can certainly pray for that. Now again, this is God's sovereign plan. This is something he's going to bring about. And then finally, I just wanted to mention, it's clear that when the Lord speeds these, well, when the Lord sends revival, he speeds this up. When he pours out of his spirit, again, people are revived. The lost are awakened. People are converted on a much grander scale, much greater scale than it happens normally. But the point is, God does this in his timetable because he's sovereign not only over his purpose, which is to fill the whole earth with the kingdom of heaven, but he's also sovereign over the timing with which he is going to bring this. He is the one who plans the end from the beginning. He not only plans what he's going to do, but he plans how he's going to do it. And the way that he's planned to do this is, again, through his church, which is why Christ commissioned his apostles to take that gospel out. But the timing is also something that he has sovereignly planned. Now, we see that in different examples in Scripture that God has a time for certain things. God had a time regarding the coming of his son as far as when he would come into the world to do this work of redemption. He predicted it, of course, from the very beginning, from the fall of Adam and Eve with the curse upon the serpent. But when it came to time frames, he actually revealed 400 and, well, let's see, what would it be, 463 years before it took place. That, that's not right, 483 years because there were 70 weeks of seven. I'm talking about Daniel's 70 weeks and how the Lord basically said there's going to be 70 weeks of seven years that are ordained for the nation of Israel, beginning with a particular decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. After 69 of those weeks of years passed, Messiah was going to come. Actually, he came on that very day. Jesus presented himself as the Messiah. When Jesus came on the scene, the first words that he said in the Gospel of Mark was this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand because the king is there. Repent and believe in the Gospel. Now again, my point was this. God had a timing. He, he sovereignly planned when Jesus was going to present himself to Israel and begin his ministry. It was after the, the 69 weeks. It couldn't have started any other time. Now, his ministry also could not have ended any other time except in the middle of the 70th week when, uh, again, the angel tells Daniel that this one who was coming, the prince, was going to basically put an end to sacrifice and grain offering and so forth. He said it would be in the middle of the week. Jesus' ministry lasted for three and a half years. At the end of that time, he was crucified, and when that sacrifice was made, all the sacrificing that was going on in the temple became ineffective, became void. And so when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, a very thick piece of cloth. God tears it saying, this system is no longer effective because my sacrifice has been made. Jesus put an end to sacrifice and grain offering exactly as the Lord said that he would. But it happened in his time. It couldn't have happened before that. It couldn't have happened after that. God has his plan. The same was true with regard to his plan to bring judgment upon Israel for rejecting his son. 
Jesus says in Matthew 24, when he's predicting all the different things that are going to happen in the world, primarily upon Israel, he says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And the reason why he said that was because that was the generation that had rejected Jesus Christ. That was the generation that God was going to bring judgment on. They couldn't pass away until all these things took place because it was God's plan to judge them for their sins. So it couldn't have happened after this generation. It had to happen during that generation. God has his timetable for everything that takes place. And the same thing is true with regard to the coming of the kingdom of God with power. God is going to pour out his spirit more powerfully to awaken and to convert and advance his kingdom. But it's going to happen in his time. And it's not going to happen a moment sooner. God is sovereign. Now, secondly, let's consider the fact that since God is sovereign, does that mean that we don't have a responsibility? That we should just simply wait around until God sends his spirit and greater power to help us do what it is we're supposed to do? Well, no. We need to do what the Lord has called us to do, whether he sends revival or not. Again, there's God's plan, and God has revealed different parts of that plan in his word, and he tells us things he's going to do, but there are certain things he doesn't tell us. He told us the timetable of when Jesus was going to come, but he hasn't given us a schedule of when he's going to be sending revivals. We don't know when that's going to happen. So there's a secret part of his will that we don't know. But there's also this part he's revealed where he says, this is what I want you to do. That's the part we're supposed to live by is what he tells us to do. So whether he's going to send revival now or not, we need to do what he's called us to do. Now, I think I told you earlier, William Carey faced a similar situation in his day. There were people who, who were called hyper-Calvinists who basically believed that, okay, we've got all these people in different nations who don't know the Lord. If God wants to save them, he's sovereign, he can do it. We'll just sit back and watch him do it. He'll do it in his time and his way. We don't have to be concerned about it. Well, William Carey, as he was wrestling with that particular issue, didn't agree. I mean, God has told us to do something. Shouldn't we do it? I mean, listen to this. I, I've got this from um, a book by Eugene Harris called Giants of the Missionary Trial. And as, as William Carey, who at the time was basically wearing several different hats, he was the village cobbler, which means he's the one who made shoes. And he was also a teacher, and he was a pastor. Well, it was early one morning, uh, Eugene Harris, right, or Harrison. It was, early one, it, was, it was early morning, and the cattle in the quiet North Hampshire pasture were disturbed by the sound of footsteps in the lane. Turning their gaze in the direction from which the sounds came, the cattle saw a familiar figure and, continuing, and continued their grazing. He was the village cobbler, carrying a load of new-made shoes to market. He was oblivious of the cattle and even of the loveliness of nature in her summer gown. His thoughts were far, far away. As he walked, he said to himself, Surely God means what he says. Surely he means for us who know him to carry the message of redemption to all men everywhere. Without a doubt, God means what he says. When he says go, he means go. When he says go ye, he means go ye. When he says into all the world, he means into all the world. When he says preach the gospel, he means preach the gospel. When he says go to every creature, he means to every creature. Surely God means what he says. With love for Christ burning in his soul, Carrie kept reading, uh, reading and rereading Isaiah 54.5. Your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. He also read in the New Testament of Christ's compassion for the lost sheep of all nations and of his command to preach the gospel to all the world. At a minister's meeting, he proposed that they consider whether the command given to the apostles to evangelize all nations is not binding on all succeeding ministers to the end of the world, seeing that the accompanying promise is of equal extent. The command is, go and teach all nations. 
The promise is, lo, I am with you. Has anyone the right to, to play leapfrog with the command and then hug the promise? J.C. Ryland was merely expressing the universal attitude of the church when he impatiently interrupted Carrie and exclaimed, sit down, young man, sit down and be still. When God wants to convert the heathen, he will do it without consulting either you or me. Carrie sat down, but a vision of faraway lands and of multitudes in darkness haunted his soul, and he could not be still. In season and out of season, in conversation and in sermon, he dealt with one all-absorbing theme, namely the responsibility of the church to launch out upon its long-neglected worldwide mission. For eight years, he devoted his spare time to making maps of heathen lands, gathering data as to their location, size, population, and religions, and to a studied presentation of the arguments supporting the view that the missionary enterprise is the church's highest and holiest endeavor. The results of these years of research and thought he incorporated in a lengthy pamphlet entitled The Inquiry. After picturing the desperate condition of the world where Christ was not known and enthroned, he put the trumpet of God to his lips and sounded the divine call to action. He closed with an appeal for persistent prayer, bold planning, and sacrificial giving. Citing his three beloved heroes, he stated, what a treasure, what a harvest must await such as Paul and Eliot and Brainerd who have given themselves wholly to God's work. What a heaven to see the myriads of the heathen who by their labors have been brought into the kingdom of God. Surely it is worthwhile to lay ourselves out with all our might in promoting Christ's kingdom. Now one thing we do need to realize here is that Carey and the spirit that came upon him was, it was this Holy Spirit prompting him to, to do what the Lord had called him to do. This was actually the result of the prayers that we're going to see this evening as the ministers and the people of New England and Scotland seek the Lord for his blessing. That blessing comes during the lifetime of Carey, who lived just the next generation away from those who were praying. By the way, he learned about David Brainerd, who was one of his three heroes from a book that Jonathan Edwards wrote. We're not going to have time to look at that in the evening um, lecture. But that was one of the two things that were encouragements to Edwards. Brainerd was like the, uh, the perfect example of one whose heart was sold out to missionary work for the Lord. But again, the point is this, that Carey was right. The command must be obeyed even when conversion is sovereignly in God's hands. And even if the same thing is true regarding revival, you know, the Lord not only determines the end, but he also determines the means to the end. And he has determined that if anyone is going to be reached with the gospel, that it has to be through those who are his. And I hope you understand from the history of revival, there haven't been that many revivals in the history of the church, and they are certainly not happening all the time. If we waited around for a revival to do anything, then people would perish in between, lots and lots of people. So with regard to revival, it's true that we cannot force God's hand to bring it, but we have to seek him for it as he commands. God tells us to pray that his kingdom would advance. The Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to govern our lives by his revealed will. We need to pray as the Lord has called us to pray, and at the same time, we need to evangelize. We need to reach out with the gospel, trusting that God will do what he pleases in his time according to his plan. So pray, evangelize, disciple, send. Whether God resends, you know, sends revival or not, the work must still go forward. Even if it goes forward more slowly during times like this, it is still the same work, and we need to carry it out no matter what the circumstances. And in the meantime, we should also pray, we should take encouragement from the scriptures that God has made a promise that the kingdom of heaven is going to expand and extend through the world much more extensively than anything that we have seen. 
that is what those who prayed in those days had in view. They believed God was going to do great things. And so they believed God for great things. And they looked to those promises and they sought him and the Lord heard and he answered. I, I hope if you have the opportunity this evening that you will come back for that lecture. I think you'll find it to be uh, very encouraging. Uh, as, as we've been going through looking at what God did in the past, we need to realize that all of that was the result of, of the people of God seeking God for his blessing. And they sought him, and they worked towards that, and they saw the Lord act. If we are ever to see the Lord do anything great, we need to remember that we're part of the means by which he's going to bring that about. So we need to use the means of prayer to seek after the Lord. And I hope by God's grace he'll encourage each one of us to do that. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and apply it to our hearts and show us how we might be able to do what he has called us to do this morning.